Hi, good morning, and welcome back to another edition of Discover History. Here at the Keys History and Discovery Center, I'm curator Brad Bertelli, and we're going to explore some more of the inaccuracies that I come across on a regular basis when I'm reading through materials. Um, and last week, we talked about uh, number uh, 10 through 6, and if you want to check out that, you can go to our YouTube page, which has uh, all of our Discover History, all, all these posts, plus uh, plus scores of others. It's a, it's a great resource if you're looking for more information about what we're doing and what we're talking about, and you want to learn some history. Our YouTube page has got lots of great, great information there, and you can find all these episodes, episodic pieces uh, there as well. So today we're going to um, continue with the um, top 10 list, uh, five through one, and we're going to start with uh, one of the most prolific uh, inaccuracies touted about this uh, uh, Alamrata in particular, and that is referring to these as the Purple Isles. Now actually there is a Purple Isle in South America, and that island is, um, is named the Purple Isle because it is a base for indigo, which is a very important dye. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense that it's a purple, a purple blue dye. But in terms of, of, of of the Matacumbi Keys, Upper Matacumbi and Lower Matacumbi Key being referred to as the Purple Isles. There is just zero uh, historical uh, 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 documentation to, to assert that. A lot of people talk about the Spanish conquistadors, you know, coming up and, and, and seeing the, the islands, the purple water surrounding the islands. But what is interesting and what really, you know, uh, works against that, 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 uh, that idea is that Matacumbi is one of the oldest place names in all of South Florida, established you know as late as you know early as 1573, um, 1575, uh, 1573, and um, on all the all the Spanish charts that you come across in the 18th and 17th uh, century, centuries and 19th centuries always refer to Upper Matacumbi and Lower Matacumbi as some version of Matacumbi, and nowhere is it Isla Mirada. Uh, that is nowhere to be found in, anywhere in the historical record. And that's the one thing I always go back to, look at the charts. There's no chart that says anything about Isla Mirada, and the, and, and the word really didn't come into, uh, well, the Isla Mirada didn't come into existence until about 1906 when the town site of Isla Mirada was established. And according to the person who established that town site, uh, William J. Crum, Isla Mirada was named after, uh, uh, meant island home. So Purple Isles, doesn't exist. It, it, it's a great, it's a you know, it's a great sexy name for the area, but it, it it it's completely inaccurate. And I wish the TDC would quit advertising these places as the Purple Isles. Uh, so number or number four, we're talking about uh, the Indian <laughs> Indian Key. A lot of people talk about the. Um, the island being attacked on August 7th, 1840, people were attacked, or the Indians were attacking the island because of Jacob Hausman. And Jacob Hausman um, was not the reason that the Indians attacked Indian Key. The reason they attacked the island was because of the warehouse and because of how, well, because of Hausman in one sense, because in his general store and also in the warehouse, there were lots of, of, of munitions, gunpowder, and guns and things, and things that, that uh, would have been really beneficial to the Indians who were Trying to uh, trying to remain in in Florida. Um, everything all right? Okay. Uh, so so the Indians did not attack Indian Key because of Jacob Hausman, even though the argument is that he you know gave, he uh, put a two hundred dollar bounty on, on every Indian's head, which was suggested to the Legislative Council but never never enacted. So it wasn't. And Henry Prine actually said uh, five hundred bucks. Per you know, for you know, on every Indian's head, but um, to clear the area. But the real reason was that the warehouse and the general store on the island had lots of provisions and lots of food and, and munitions and gunpowder and things that would be beneficial to the Indians. So we're going to go now to three. Another one of those of those ideas that is uh, misconstrued and, and, and bandied around a, a lot that the wreckers used to to light false lights and to uh, draw these these ships off you know off of off the reef and to their to wreck into their doom so the wreckers could go out there and then salvage them now uh 
prior to this becoming an American territory uh, in 1821 with the adams Elness Treaty, which included you know, the Florida Territory, also the Florida Keys, and also the Florida Reef. That may have happened in, in the early days, early days of wrecking. But when it became an American, port of, American territory, American possession, that really kind of went out, went, went out of, you know, didn't really happen, and there's no evidence, there's nothing to support that other than, you know, the, your general tales of, of sailors you know, sipping rum and, 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 and talking about it. Mostly that happens today. Uh, and you know, talking about how the wreckers were, were a little better than pirates and would draw these, these ships off, off course. There's a, a great example of, um, of, of, this being, uh, um, of, of this being said. And, and it turned out it, it, there was a, um, a, of a false light on tea table key that is reported. But that was actually a campfire that, um, or, or, or a fire that was for people who were actually living on the island or staying on the island at the time. And they were just cooking or keeping warm and or keeping mosquitoes at bay and not necessarily drawing drawing the ships on uh, off the reef to their doom there was in, in 1823 with the uh, the first uh, kind of wrecking laws that came into effect as an American territory and among those um, among the, the list of things of provisions there um, and, and it did say that the setting of false lights is you know would be uh, punishable by death um, I believe by death but so there was probably something that happened prior in you know prior to late 1700s maybe the early 1800s um, but after the, after the reef became an American possession that's really more of a wives tale and didn't really happen uh, um, and you know that's and, and after this becomes an American territory, that's when wrecking really becomes more of a uh, more leg legitimized and, and had to be, you know, uh, wrecking licenses and, and, and there's much more regulated is the word I'm looking for by the courts and, and, and a series of laws. So. Um, while that is a great story, it's a great myth, there's really no documentation that says that wreckers used to set false lights um, to draw ships offshore. Uh, so we're going to go from there, and we're going to go to Pirates in the Florida Keys, another great story, another great one that's, that's talked about, and people are, are you know, saying that you know, the, the, it, it seems like the Pirates would be in the Florida Keys. It seems like you know, a great combination, kind of like rum and lime, the, the Florida Keys and, and, and piracy, but there really is no evidence to support pirates living in the Florida Keys or using the Florida Keys as, as any kind of base of operations. When Commodore David Porter arrives in 1823 and sets up shop down in Key West, he makes pretty short work of the pirates of the West Indies, which is his job was to come here and to this area to clear the, the wa local waters of piracy because you know we're, we're trying to, Again, because this is an American territory, they want to make sure that the passage, the, uh, the, the Florida Straits are safe, and especially for all the commerce coming from New Orleans, New Orleans and, and Mississippi River coming ar around the bend and up to the East Coast markets. But most of the pirates that he is chasing are Cuban pirates and Puerto Rican pirates and Mexican pirates um, or, 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 or um, uh, pirates based in these areas and not so much, not in the Florida Keys as well. There's, not really in the Florida Keys, there is a great map that shows, um, that lists all of the pirate aggressions against American sailors. And of the 89 or 93 documented cases of pirates attacking uh, American interests, only two uh, mentioned the Florida Keys, one off the coast of the Florida Keys on, on, on the Florida Straits, where piracy was definitely out on the reef line, because piracy was off, you know, often a, uh, you know, Often these ships were victims of circumstance. The pirates, the pirates would show up. A ship is stuck on the reef, and you know it's it, it's it's you know easy pickings for the pirates. Um, but there are but even on, on this when, when Porter comes to town to clear or comes to the the Keys and to clear the area of pirates, there really isn't any piracy happening in the Florida Keys itself, but in the water surrounding the West Indies and Puerto Rico and, and, and Cuba and Mexico, Central, uh, Central America, Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula, that area. So as, as for pirates in the Florida Keys, again, no documented cases uh, or, or very few documented cases. There, there's one instance in uh, 19, 1829 where Jacob Hausman is um, 
is uh, uh, his ship is boarded by a pirate and taken hostage for a brief period of time. But in this case, the pirate had been chased from Cuba across the Florida Straits, and he was stuck, the, the pirate got stuck. Uh, Hausman, being a wrecker, went to offer assistance, and then he was held at gunpoint, and then other wreckers kind of chased him, chased him off, and that wrecker, fin or, or that pirate finally relinquished, uh, gave, uh, gave Hausen back his boat and, and he was taken into custody. I believe he was taken into custody. Um, but, it, but there were instances of piracy in the area, but as far as them being on, on the Florida Keys and operating out of the Florida Keys, that are, there's just no, there's no documentation to support that. Which brings us to our good friend Black Caesar, who's probably the most notorious pirate to, um, to, you know, to be associated with the Florida Keys. And his stories are extremely wild. Um, they op and they operate from, uh, from the 1600s to the 1800s. So he was a, a long-lived pirate. There's many versions of him. There's three or four different versions of Black Caesar. The most common version is when, um, that he was also a, a, a fearsome lieutenant that, um, that served with Blackbeard, Edward Teach, or Thatch, which is actually his real name. And there was a Caesar on Blackbeard's boat when he was attacked in Ocracoke, Oak, or Ocracoke, North Carolina, um, and w w when Blackbeard was killed. And there was a Caesar on ship, on board, but that Caesar was not some hulking, uh, fearsome uh, lieutenant. It was a black, uh, probably a, a slave uh, that, that, according to uh, Blackbeard himself, uh, was someone that he had he had um, kind of raised raised up. So again, not some uh, pirate that had been uh, had been taken from Africa, some hulking African uh, you know prince who who or chieftain who had come from uh, from Africa and and survived a shipwreck, landed on, on Elliot Key, and then developed the, 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 this piratical empire on Elliot Key, who later would join uh, Blackbeard, that, that story never happened. And then the second version of Black, uh, of Black Caesar, again, is, is similar. That This is a, a Haitian slave who rises to power in the early 1800s, captures a Spanish ship, and then takes off on piracy, you know, takes off on some piratical adventures, again ends up on, on uh, Elliot Key, and then um, through, depending on which version you read, because there are a, a zillion versions of, of Black Caesar, ends up going to Sanibel or Captiva to join forces with Jose Gaspar, which turns out to be another invented pirate who never existed. So Jose Gaspar wasn't real. Black Caesar, um, in, in those instances, was not a real pirate, but a, but a, really, a really great story. And um, it, it, it's one of, those, uh, one of those stories that is, really becomes confusing. And the more you study Black Caesar, the more you look at it, the more the, the, these two uh, versions, uh, the, the two primary versions, the African chieftain and then the, the Haitian slave really begin, begin to mix. And a lot of the stories that are told about Black Caesar kind of combine these two these, these elements from both stories into one story, which makes it super confusing and also kind of uh, takes away a lot of, of any possibility of, of him being a, a real pirate. So there's no evidence on Elliot Key of, of, of any kind of, of no, there's no archeological evidence on, on, on Elliot Key of any kind of piratic uh, um, uh, or treasure or um, or uh, uh, or um, forts where where Black Caesar was said to hold you know of hundreds or many captive women. There's just no evidence to support any of that, any of the stories other than than just just people telling stories, drinking rum, and having a good time. So that is our top 10 list of things that are often told about uh, Florida Keys history that really have no basis in fact, but they're great stories to tell. I'm sure they'll can be continued to be told, and I will continue to do my best to rebut them and to present more accurate histories that better reflect you know, what really was going on in the Florida Keys during the history of, of this island chain, especially during American op, um, um, ownership. So I um, hope you enjoyed that 10, top 10 list. I think I enjoyed doing it. I think I'm going to do this again um, at some point in the next month. I'll put together another top 10 list of things. And in the meantime, uh, I hope you guys have a great week. We'll see you back again next Tuesday for another edition of Discover History. And in the meantime, you guys have a great week. And is there a question?
Um, there are some questions for you to just let them know you'll follow up with them okay. when you get back to your career. You'll just tell them that. I will go back. I, uh, Aaron says there's some questions on the, uh, people are, are typing in. I will definitely get back to them uh, once I get back to my, uh, to my office and I will address them as, as you write. I'll be ha I'm always happy to, to answer all those questions. So I'll be sure to get to those later on today. So you guys have a great week and we will see you next Tuesday for some more Discover History here at the Keys History and Discovery Center.